most seminary professors will tell you that there's three types of passages of scriptures that are really hard to preach. The first type of, of passages that are really hard to preach are passages that your audience is not familiar with it at all. So like Leviticus or Obadiah or Amos or something like that. It's, the, it's those parts where like the pages are still kind of glued together because you haven't even gone there. Okay, so like that's a really hard one to preach. Another one that's actually really hard to preach is the passages where everybody knows the stories. So the, the Daniel in the lion's den and the David and Goliath and, um, and Jesus on the cross, like those are very, very well known. And, and oftentimes when they're really super well known, people kind of check out because they're like, well, I've already heard this story before. The last type of passages that most seminary professors say do not preach is the lists. The genealogies, the names. Now, just by a show of hands, how many of you, when you get to the names, you just skip on over to the next? Yeah, let's be honest in this room. You just skip on over right over to the next. Well, thankfully, I did not go to seminary. So I'm preaching the list, baby. I am preaching. I'm preaching the list. So we're going to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter one is where we're going to be today. We're gonna to read through verse eight. We got 18 verses that we're gonna go through. And then I've only got two other verses in the message. So that's, if you can just hang with me here. All right, just stay locked in. We are going, I'm gonna preach the list. Are you ready? So, hey, listen, first off, pray for your pastor because there's some names on here. I'm just going quick, okay? Just, when you don't know the names, just say it confidently and quickly. That's how this this works here, okay? So we're gonna go Matthew chapter one. We're gonna look verse one. We're gonna go read through verse 18 here, and it says this. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Judah and his brothers. You're gonna have to stay with me. We're going quick here. And Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Benadab, and Aminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon. And Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of uh, uh, Abijah, uh, yeah. Abijah, Abijah, Abijah. Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Jor Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah. Now we're about to get into some weird names here. And Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah. Josiah the father of Jacom, and, Jacom and his brothers, and at the time, <laughs> see how that works? Don't judge your pastor, okay? In the time of the deportation, Babylon, Jaconia, I was the father, Chantel, um, and Chantel, the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel, the father of Abunadab, Abunadab, the father of Elia, oh, Jesus. Eliakim, and Eliakim, the father of Azor, and Azor, the father of Zadok, and Zadok, the father of Kim, and Akim, the father of Eliud, and Eliud, the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar, the father of Mathen, and Mathen, the father of Jacob. Finally, a word I know. Okay. <laughs> Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. <sighs> We're not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation of Babylon, 14 generations. And from David to the deportation of, oh, I did that twice. Uh, from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. And now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. And God, we are so grateful for this part of scripture how often so overlooked, yet so powerful, because we know that your word says that all scripture is God-breathed and inspired by you and is powerful in our lives. And so today, give us ears to hear. God, help me to communicate 
what you want to say today to your people. Lord, I pray that uh, the, the, the church has ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying today. God, we love you. Lord, please be with our New Orleans saints. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You don't have unless you ask, everybody. So let's, let's, be, let's be honest here. Most of us, when it comes to the genealogies in all scriptures, uh, skip the list, right? Because, I mean, who wants to read baby daddy after 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 baby daddy? After baby daddy? Nobody wants to read those. Um, but if you skip the list, specifically if you skip the Matthew 1 list, you miss the power of the list because there's so much power in this list and, and what you really miss is you miss Christmas. Christmas really can't be Christmas unless you have this list. To skip this list would be to the be equivalent of you handing out Christmas gifts to your family and to your children without wrapping paper. Just giving gifts away with no wrapping paper. The wrapping paper is what gets you excited about the gift. And the genealogy of Jesus is really kind of the wrapping paper. It's what, it's what is the, the thing that gets us most excited about the culmination of this greatest gift that we've ever been given, which is in Jesus Christ. There's power in this list. There's names of people and stories that are in this list that you can't just quickly overlook. And we've got to ask ourselves, though, why does Matthew begin with the list? Because Matthew, John, Mark, and Luke, all gospels, all wrote about Jesus, but Matthew's done it so differently than everybody else. I mean, you think about it for a moment. John, when he opened up, if you go read the book of John, John chapter one starts this way. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. I mean, like, like this deep theological Scripture, and then if you go to Mark, Mark, uh, you go to Mark, and Mark just straight up skips past the birth and goes to adult Jesus. Like Mark, just like I don't even care about the birth. Let's just talk about Jesus as an adult. All right. And then you go to Luke, and Luke is a doctor, and Luke is precise, and Luke is detailed, and Luke, Luke at the beginning of Luke starts off with, I have given this very intentional thought. I have gone through the order, and I'm sharing this with you in detail. Oftentimes when we read the birth of Jesus, we read out of Luke chapter 2, but Matthew, Matthew does it completely different. Matthew is writing to even a different audience. Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience. And this Jewish audience would have been for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years been waiting for this anticipated Messiah that would come. And Matthew, who is a Jewish tax collector, who worked for the Roman government as a Jewish tax collector, who was very hated by most Jews, he's got a different perspective on everything. Matthew comes into the story wanting to try to convince the Jewish people, hey, listen, I know you know Father Abraham, that's your father, because everybody knows Father Abraham, but I'm here today to tell you that if you think Abraham's awesome, wait till you meet Jesus. Jesus is the culmination of everything that you've been longing for, everything that you've been waiting for. All of the Old Testament had 300 prophecies of this Messiah that would one day come. And here we are on the scene in Matthew chapter 1, and you get all of these father of the father of the father of the father of the father. And what Matthew is trying, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to help us see is what it took for Jesus to actually get here because Jesus is not only the king on earth because he's from heaven, Jesus is the king on earth because he came through the lineage of a king. So he's king by nature and he's king by, by heavenly assignment, both in kingship. And so today we're gonna look into that. Now, really the genealogy is like your ancestry. Um, a couple years ago, uh, Lindsay asked me what I want for Christmas. So Lindsay and I kind of, we make Christmas easy. Listen, how many of you know Christmas can be complicated? Yeah. Lindsay and I were just having this conversation the other day. She was like, I don't know. Like all of, our, all of our family calls us and asks us what our kids need. And then we call them and ask them what they need. And we buy them gifts and they buy us gifts of what we need. And then we open the present acting like we surprised. She was like, could we just maybe not, and we just buy ourselves our own gifts, and they buy themselves their own gifts. Like, we make this a lot easier. So that's kind of what Lindsay and I do. We, we really kind of just, hey, what do you want? And Lindsay actually just buys her own Christmas gift. Um, I know, sounds bad for me, but she loves it. Don't judge me, okay? 
So she always, I'm buying it. Okay, good. Merry Christmas. All right. So a couple years ago, I was like, I know what I want for Christmas. I said, I want to look into my ancestry. So I would like to, uh, for my own Christmas gift, buy uh, a, a, a subscription or whatever to Ancestry.com, uh, which is a weird request, but it's just kind of what I want to do. I want to like dive into a little bit of that, like I was getting into my 40s and I'm like, you know, thinking back on my life and then I'm thinking into the future and I'm just having those kind of things. And I was like, I want to know like where I come from. I want to know like what's my heritage. I want to know if I am like, you know, related to like Abraham Lincoln or something. Like I want to know, is there like royalty in my, in my heritage, which there's not, but um, <laughs> at least that I don't know. But I, I, found out, I found out a number of things about myself. I am about 70%, um, my, like my mix is 70% from England, Scotland, and Wales. Um, and so I've got kind of a British side, which I know most of y'all thought I was British. And then, <laughs> and then I've got 30% that is Mexican and Spanish. That's, 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 that's so yo quiero Taco Bell, okay? <laughs> And I love some fish and chips. Okay, so, uh, I, so I've got both of those. So I found out, I, you know, and it's cool because you like, you send off, you know, your stuff and then, you know, it starts like going through these crazy archives. It's crazy. They'll like send these things. I don't, has anybody done it? It's, it's wild. It's wild. They start sending you like old pictures. Like, are you related to this person? Are you related to this person? And there's certain people like I saw and I'm like, I can't, no, please, no, no. <laughs> Yes, I accept you. Yes, I accept you. Yes, you're in. And when you, cause when you look at your, like, your ancestry, it, it informs who you are. It informs a lot of why you are the way that you are. You learn about your family and uh, the legacy of what you've come from, because this is huge. And, and just as much as it's maybe a saying or not a saying for you, in biblical days, the genealogy was a huge deal because where you came from and who you came from was like your resume. Like, like when you went into a job interview, they didn't ask you, who's your mama? They asked you, who's your daddy? And that's why you saw all the men that are on here, because your fathers, your grandfathers, great, 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 great grandfathers informed a lot of things. And based on of your lineage depended on if you had favor that opened doors for you or if it shut the door on you. Depending on where you came from, depending on your background, depending on your ethnicity, depending on so many different things would depend on a lot of things that you would get in your life. And all of us have a part of our resume. Think about this just for a moment. All of us have a part. If you're sending off a resume to a job, how many know when you send off a resume to the job, you're putting all of your highlights all of your best parts, all of everything that makes you look amazing. And today, we're, you're gonna see in just a minute in this moment that, that Matthew is going to show us not only just some highlights, but he's also gonna show us some, some lowlights. Matthew, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, does not omit the crazy people out of the family. He puts them right in the middle of it. I mean, how many of you, when you look in through your family tree and you're starting to like, I mean, are there certain people in your family that you introduce and there are certain people in your family you explain? Y'all yeah. <laughs> know what I'm talking about? Y'all, yeah. yeah. Yo, you want to know about my uncle? You don't have time. You don't have time. <laughs> Let me tell you. When Jesus thinks back at his heritage, his resume and, and, and lineage of people, he's got some family he introduces and then he's got some family he going to have to explain you going to have to explain. And so what, what makes this genealogy crazy on a whole nother level is not only just some of the men that are on this list, but the fact that he mentions women on this list. This is a huge deal because this was a patriarchal society in any time. Listen, the only place in scripture you will see a genealogy that has women is this one. It's the only one. You will not see it in any, go look at all of them. I already looked, you don't even have to. You, they will, they're not on any other ones than this one. 
And that is a huge deal because this was a male-dominated chauvinistic society. And so when a woman got introduced, you can imagine for a Jewish listener, as they're reading this, this letter, as they're reading Matthew's gospel, and they get to these women, they go, whoa, hold up. Why is she up in here? This is, this is supposed to be father, 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 and here we have mother, father, mother, father. So today I thought to help me preach the genealogy, to help me preach Jesus' family, I thought I would give us a little bit of some visual illustration. So we all have our nativity scenes here, okay? So of course in the nativity scene you've got, you got Mary and Jesus and Joseph um, that is the epitome of a nativity scene. We've got a couple, couple lambs. <laughs> We've got some, got some cows. We've got all that. We stand, stand, stay. Good boy. All right. We've got wise men, <laughs> right, that we're here at the lineage. But what, what makes this story absolutely crazy is not only do you have these people that are at the nativity scene, but we've also got four women that we have now introduced into, into the storyline. Now think about this just for a moment here, how crazy this is. This is supposed to be Mary and Jesus and Joseph. Why do we got these four that are inside of this? This doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So I want to do today is I want us to actually go back and I want us to actually look at some of this because, hey, listen, this nativity scene here without this looks all good. But how many know just because it's the scene doesn't mean it's the story? Because some of us like to show scenes of our life, but nobody knows the story. The story informs the scene, right? We take snapshots and we post scenes. Oh, look at that. But you don't realize there's a whole story. Everybody going, you know, if you take family po photos, you're going to post all that on Facebook and it's going to, eh. they just don't know the story of what it took to get to that moment that you were, you were literally threatening kids with their lives. <laughs> For you to post on Facebook and everybody go, oh, look at that beautiful family. Look at that beautiful family. You don't know three of those kids thought that they were going to meet Jesus that day. <laughs> You didn't know, right? That's the story. That's the story. We're about to post our family picture soon. Just know, that's, that wasn't it though. That didn't, that didn't happen for us. So, um, she praising Jesus? What we got going on here? Okay, so we'll go ahead. We'll get, we'll get both of you up. So, all right. So this is what I wanna do. I wanna introduce you to the five ladies that is mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. These five ladies, okay? We're gonna, we're gonna go there today. And I want you to write this down. Here's, I got two, two points today. Super simple. We might even be out early, but I'm not promising anything. Okay, so two points. Here's the two points today. Point number one, God can use and redeem any situation. God can use and redeem any situation. This is why it's so important that we don't skip the list because you're going to see as we unpack these stories and more stories, you're going to see how God can take a broken people that make messy situations and still his purposes prevail. You're gonna see this, you're gonna see as we go. So let's start with Tamar, all right? Tamar, come on forward, Tamar, all right. Gotta watch out for them redheads, all right? So. <laughs> Tamar is in found, be careful, be careful. Genesis chapter 38, we get introduced to this lady right here. We get introduced to Tamar in Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38, Tamar is married to one of Judah's sons. Judah has a number of sons. He gets married to one of his sons. One of the sons dies. Uh, and so when a, when a son would die, it's the father, the father-in-law's responsibility to make sure that, that, that his daughter-in-law gets married to another brother. That's how it worked. Thank God it don't work like that now, but that's how it worked then. And so Judah had made a promise to Tamar that she was going to make sure that she married the next brother in line. Well, he, he backed out of his promise. 
And so, and so Tamar, she, she like, she don't play. So she was like, okay, all right, you going to do me like that? Let me tell you what I'm going to do. So what she does is she dresses herself up in the nicest of garb. She goes down to the brothel where all of the Jewish men like to go hang out. As they're drinking and carousing and all this stuff, she seduces her father-in-law, Judah. Oh, it gets better. She seduces him. He sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. She gets pregnant. But, but, but Tamar is very, very smart, though, because she kept his fruit of the looms. <laughs> she kept the fruit of the looms. And so there came a moment where she was now with child, and Judah finds out that his daughter-in-law is pregnant. And he thinks, what in the world? She has cheated on the family. And he begins to issue out a, de- a decree for her to be burned burned the woman, burned the woman, but yet like Jerry Springle style, she flips the script and says, oh, by the way, I happen to have a little fruit of the loom here. Let's see whose fruit of the looms these are. And he immediately decided, "Uh uh-oh. Uh-oh, nope, nope, nope. You ain't ain't gonna play me like this. You ain't gonna play me like this. And Tamar reveals that Judah is the grandpa daddy. (laughs) That's grandpa daddy right there. Tamar in Jesus' lineage right there. That's, that, that's her there. All right. Then we've got Rahab. Rahab. Rahab, Rahab. Now, Rahab is a Canaanite. She's not Jewish. She is a Canaanite. Totally different. Uh, these are the enemy of God. These are the enemy people of God. Now, uh, Tamar was not a prostitute. She acted like a prostitute to get back at her father-in-law. Rahab was a prostitute. She was a people of the streets. Joshua chapter 2 describes her as Rahab the harlot. Now just think for a moment. Matthew is sharing the list, the family lineage of Jesus. All right? And think about the fact that Matthew adds not only Tamar into the lineage of Jesus, but now he he invites Rahab the harlot. I mean, no, that person, I mean, no, when you're doing a resume and you think of a, you think of a, of a, am I, my, oh my goodness, I'm, she is a woman of non-discretion. So, thank y'all, thank y'all. Maybe we, you know what, this is real and raw right here. This is what it is. Let me fix you, girl. Let me fix you here. So, we are in church, all right? So, <laughs> so Rahab, now think about this, watch. If you're, if you're sending off your resume and you've got to put down references, <laughs> she ain't on it. She ain't on it. And yet in the story of Joshua chapter 2, Joshua sends spies into uh, into Jericho, and this woman, Rahab, invites those spies into her house, and she actually hides them from getting killed, and she actually saves uh, the whole nation because of her uh, ability and uh, her desire to want to help God's people. And God actually radically saves her family from all of the destruction as well. And so she saves her family, she saves God's family. And how many know God is a father who's a willing to adopt anyone that will put his preferences above anything else, even if you've got a sketchy past? Even if you've got a sketchy past. And she, Rahab, became the great, great grandmother to King David. Someone that was not in the lineage of a Jewish history, but was invited into the family of God. So you've got got Tamar, we've got Rahab, oh, and then we have this one here, right here. This one's huge here. This is Ruth. Ruth. Now, Ruth is a Moabite. Ruth is also a part of a people who are jacked up pagan people. Ruth is not a part of the family of God whatsoever, but she uh, gets connected to a woman that is a woman of God. These people were the worst of the generation to what's going to be her mother-in-law, which is Naomi. Her husband dies, and then she goes to Naomi, her mother-in-law, and pretty much says this, wherever you go, I'm going. Like, I don't have a man. I don't have a family. 
I, I, the best I have is to stay with you. So she stays with Naomi. And if you know the story of Ruth, she, her, her life intersects with a man of God by the name of Boaz. And Boaz becomes her husband. And yet again, in that moment, because she marries into Boaz, she gets married into the family of God, but she was not a part of the family of God. Now, she wasn't a prostitute and she didn't prostitute herself at all, but she becomes, watch this, she goes from the worst of the worst of Gentiles to being invited into God's family And if you fast forward, the story of Ruth becomes one of the godliest women in all of scripture. She saves her entire nation. This is a woman that was used powerfully by God. How many know you may have a horrible family, but you're always welcome into the family of God and God can restore and redeem any situation in any family. This is what he does. Okay, all right, so then we've got this. And then our last, our our fourth one, that's praising the Lord right here. This is the wife of Uriah. Her name is Bathsheba. Bathsheba. This is the wife of Uriah. Her name is Bathsheba. And and think about it yet again. Matthew is sharing the genealogy, the story of Jesus. And here we are. He wants to make sure that we share the most scandalous story yet. Because the story of the wife of Uriah is the story of Bathsheba when David was uh, supposed to go out to war with all of his Uh, army, but instead he decides to stay back and he's walking on the top of his palace overseeing all of his kingdom. And the Bible says that as he's peering over the top of his kingdom, he sees a woman bathing down. And if you've watched VeggieTales, it says he wanted her ducky. (laughs) (laughs) He did not want her ducky though, I can tell you that. (laughs) He sends out a text message to her and says, hey girl, the king wants to see you. She comes into the, his kingdom and um, his palace and he sl- sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. Man of God, right? Man after God's own heart. Sleeps with her, gets her pregnant, finds out that she's pregnant, invites her husband to come into the town tries to get her husband to sleep with her to cover up the situation. He is such a man of nobility and honor, he won't even sleep at his home. He stays on the doorstep of the castle of the house because he's a man of honor because his men are out to war. So David devises a plan to send him back out to war for him to be assassinated. And he does, and he dies. And David takes Bathsheba as his wife and the child that he bears with Bathsheba dies. But they have another child, and that second child that they have is, is and becomes the wisest man in all of Scripture, a guy by the name of Solomon. This is the wife of Uriah. I'm telling you right now, listen, how many know the Bible is the original TMZ? This is like the desperate housewives of Israel right here, okay? This is it. Ain't this the truth? And then you've got, now watch this. And then we've got Mary. Now we've got Mary. Mary is a teenager who gets pregnant by God and then has to go around and say, God did this, God did this, God did this. So can you imagine a woman who did not invite that into her life, but God chose her, God divinely picked her, God impregnated her and God used her to bring the king of kings into the world. And here we are, we have the five women of scripture. I think it's important for us to recognize first and foremost, as I said last week, that God values everyone. And in a, in a patriarchal Jewish society where women were degraded, God made sure that, that women were in the genealogy of Jesus to make sure that, hey, even if these women have sketchy past, they are still highly valued in my eyes. They're still used by God. They're still called by God. And God himself wouldn't be here if it wasn't for these women. Secondly, secondly, within all of that is we've got to realize these guys, the other men, they're not clean. It's always like we always want to make, make fun of Eve, like she was the problem. But the Bible says Adam stood right by her. So it wasn't really even just Eve. It was the fact that her husband didn't do anything. 
And the same is true as you look throughout the lineage of Jesus. David, man after God's own heart, he's a worship leader, he's a king, he's a warrior, but he also committed adultery and murder. Abraham gave his wife away twice. I mean, no, once is enough. At some point you would learn. <laughs> twice, he gave away his wife twice. Twice, definitely too many. Jacob, his name means deceiver. He married two sisters at the same time. Woo! Just call him for trouble. Judah, jealous of his brother Joseph, kidnaps him and with his other brother sells him into slavery. How many of you right now feel pretty good about your family? <laughs> Anybody? And that leads to my second point today. And that is that God came through broken people for broken people. The reason this preaches is because it is a reminder to you and I that the genealogy of Jesus is a reminder that Jesus did not just come to save people in Matthew chapter nine, but he came through broken people in Matthew chapter one. This is a huge part of the story of Christ. Jesus' family is filled with cheaters and liars and murderers and adulterers and prostitutes and the sexual and moral and the broken and the messy and the outcast and Matthew, the chief of sinners is introducing us to the one who is the friend of sinners. This is who he is. I love how Martin Luther said it. He put it this way. Watch what he said. Martin Luther said, Jesus is the kind of person who is not ashamed of sinners. In fact, he even puts them in his family tree. This is what he does. You know, I've figured out why God uses broken people. I think I've cracked the code. It's because it's all he has. It's all he's got. The reason he uses broken people is because that's all he's got. So I want every person in this room to hear this, those that are watching online. This is a church, and God is, a, is, a, is, is so desiring for you to hear this that you can come as you are. He loves you as you are. He welcomes you as you are but he loves you enough to not let you stay as you are. So how many know? Prostitute, sexually immoral, cheater, liar, but they don't stay there. They don't stay stuck in that dysfunction. I mean, no, God doesn't get glory out of using perfect people. He gets glory out of using imperfect people that realize that they couldn't be and do what they do without Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Let me show you scripture here. Let me show you what scripture. Ephesians 1, 4 through 5 says this. Even before he made the world, so even before all of this story even happened, even before there was, a, there was a messy past that we could be ashamed of, even before there was things in our past that we feel guilty of, even before any of that ever happened, help me here, God what? Love. Come on, he loved us, and he what? And he chose us in Christ to be holy, to be without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance, like he chose you in advance, to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. The only thing that makes this jacked up, messed up story not as messed up is this baby that's in the center of it all. How many know? When Jesus is in the center of your story, it does not matter about anything else because Jesus can redeem and heal and restore all of the stories, all of the men, all of the women. I'm in the family not because of what I'm done. I'm in the family because of what this baby has done when he grows up to become the savior of the world. Jesus changes our story. Jesus changes our story. And where we get into problems is when we want to look at the scene, but we don't want to share the story. Or we only want to look at a scene of our life and see how good it is, and we don't share the story of, let me tell you why I am where I am today. It's because of this baby who did not stay a baby, but raised up into becoming a man of God. And the Christmas story is a powerful story, and we'll share more of this in the weeks to come. And here's why the Christmas story is such a powerful story. Because the son of man became a man so that man can become a son. This is what he did. 
The son of man became a man so that every man, woman, child can become a son. We became a son of God, a daughter of God. This is because of what Jesus has done. And so if we learn anything from the genealogy and the list, what's powerful in the list is that God can take any situation and he can redeem it and he can use it. Any situation, any situation, any painful moment you've been through, he can use it and he can redeem it. Anything that you're ashamed of, he can use it and he can redeem it. Every single one of these stories were stories that were filled with such shame and such regret and such guilt. And yet God says, even those stories are the best stories because those are the stories where I get the credit and I get to come through that lineage to remind everybody that everybody that came before me, I can forgive them. And everybody after me that's going to do these kind of things, I can forgive them too. I can forgive them too. This is the gospel that we preach. Matthew 1 21. Let's look of this. It says this, she, speaking of Mary, this fifth woman that is in the genealogy, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. I want to end today with this. And this is huge here for all of us in this room that have guilt that continues to play, um, overwhelm us, Maybe you can't get past something that you've done in the past or maybe something you're doing currently in the present. But what Jesus did on the cross, on that tree, is way more powerful than any sin that is in your family tree. Amen. How many know that tree can fix your family tree? Because Jesus says, I put it in my family tree so you could know that his grace is sufficient. Anybody in this room grateful for the grace of God, the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, that he is rich in mercy. This is the God that we serve. So just two points. God can use and redeem any situation, any situation. Whatever you're going through right now or whatever you've gone through in the past, God can use it and redeem it. There's nothing too far, no one too broken that God can't use and redeem. Listen, I mean, I mean if we just look at these ladies right here, how I many know God can use anyone? God can use anyone. But then lastly, realizing that God came through broken people for broken people. So if you are in this house or if you're watching online right now and you are broken, welcome to the family. Guess what? That's the title of today's message. Welcome to the family. Come on, look at your neighbor. Say, welcome to the family. You a little jacked up? Welcome to the family. You a little crazy? Welcome to the family. You got some stuff in your past that's a little sketchy? Welcome to the family. But also realize what invites us into the family is this one that's in the center of it all. And not until is he in the center place of our life that our life actually gets turned around, redeemed, and restored. Now I end today with, um, how many are married in the room? If you're married, raise your hand just so I know who I'm talking to. Okay, you're married. How many of you remember when you sent out wedding invitations? Y'all remember that demonic thing that you had to do? That was just, oh, terrible. I hated it. And I don't know what it was. Lindsay and I, Lindsay and I will celebrate 20 years in April. So this is 20 years ago. Yeah, come on. We're excited. Um, Congratulations to my wife. She's kept, she's kept me around for 20 years. So 20 years, I don't, I don't know why this was a deal back in there, but I, anybody in here, when you sent out your wedding invitations, you had that little flimsy paper that you had to put inside of there that just made it like fancy? It's like, I don't know where this came from, but we had like, had like a picture, and then we had the invite. Then we had that little flimsy paper that was in there. It was like fancy, really like fancy stuff. Like nowadays, like people don't even have to do invites anymore. Like it's like you're invited on Facebook, like come. <laughs> like that would have been so much better, all right? So much cheaper too. But now you've got like all these really fancy, you know, like expensive lettering and, you know, all these things that, that they have to do. But I don't know if you've realized this, they've actually now started sending out, people have started sending out your not invited invitations. Yes. Yes, I know I said the same thing when I heard it. No way. Could you imagine? Like you've got so many people in your family. You're like, you, you, nope, you, you, nope, 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 you. 
Like, and here's, here's how they would say it. We, we had a, <laughs> listen to this. We've had to be pretty brutal in chopping down our guest list. I'm so sad you will not be there with us on that day. <laughs> but we look forward to catching up with you soon. <laughs> Please bring a gift. All right. <laughs> How many of you in here are glad that Jesus never sent uninvited gifts, uh, uninvited <laughs> letters, cards? I mean, no, Jesus says all are invited, all are welcome. I'm just grateful for that. All are invited, all are welcome. No matter what you've done, no matter what your past is, all are invited. All are welcome. Father, we love you. God, we thank you today that, uh, that we are in this house because of an invitation. Maybe some are here at church today because of an invitation. But they didn't realize that that invitation was actually going to be a part of a greater invitation of you inviting people to come to know you as their Lord and Savior. And I want to speak to really two people today as we close in today's service. I want to speak to, first off, those that are in this room, you are saved. Jesus is the Lord of your life. You love him. But if you're, if you're honest, you've been in a rough place. You've been in a bad place. You've maybe been disconnected from the Lord, or maybe there's some things that are going on right now that has really just impacted your relationship with God and today, I just want you to hear me. God can use anything and redeem anything. He can draw you back to himself. And if that's you in this house, and you say, I, I, Pastor Josh, would you just pray for me, man? I, I'm, I'm just in a rough season right now, and I really want to draw closer to the Lord. If that's you, would you just raise your hand so I know who I'm, who I'm praying over? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, man. Hands going up all over the place. Thank you so much. Would you do this? Uh, there's no shame in this. Come on. This is, this is a, we're all broken. Would you just lift both hands right there where you are? And I just want to pray over you. If that's you online as well, just, just if you can, just lift both hands right there. Holy Spirit, come do what you do. Come do what you do. We invite you to come and, and speak encouragement over your people. I rebuke every lie of the enemy right now that their value, that their love is based off of their performance. They are no more loved right now than they've ever been in their entire life. God, your word said, as we read just a minute ago, that before the foundations of the world, you chose them, you loved them, you adopted them. They are sons and daughters of the king. May they lift their heads high right now, knowing that they are loved by the king, accepted by the king, forgiven by the king, welcomed into their home as a king, as sons and daughters of the king. God, I pray, Lord, that that would be a resounding encouragement in their heart and soul right now. And Lord, maybe if there is something that they're doing right now that is impacting their walk with you, maybe there's been some sin that they've uh, participated in. Maybe there's been some, some things that they've said that has, has distanced from, from you. It's not that you've left them, it's that they've left you. And so, Father, I pray that there would be a returning of home, a coming back to, a calling to, an invitation. God, we thank you that when we call out to you, you are so near and dear to them right now. So, Holy Spirit, would you just speak to them? Would you draw them to yourself right now? Would you just put your hands down right there? And I, I wanna do this. If you're here in this room and you have never invited Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life. You have never gone all in to say, God, I am following you. Jesus is after, after our hearts. The Bible says if we will confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. And it's not just a prayer. Really, it's a lifestyle. It's a commitment to go all in. Jesus did on the cross. He did for your sins and for my sins to take away the thing that has divided us from him. If you're here in this room and you have never placed Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life to be what the Bible would call being born again, meaning that the spirit, your spirit comes alive on the inside of you. And God makes you new in him. Old is past and the new becomes right now. If that's you in this room, would you just shoot your hands up all across this room and say, that's me, Pastor Josh. That's me. Is there anybody else? Okay, thank you right there. 
Praise God, praise God. Anybody else here? If you're online and that's you, you. And I want everybody in this room to pray with those that are here in this room and those that are watching online. Would you just pray with me? Would you say, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to be my Savior, to be my Lord. Today, I repent of my sins and I turn to Jesus. Forgive me, cleanse me. From this day forward, I wanna follow you all the days of my life. God be my Father, Jesus be my Savior, and Holy Spirit be my helper. In Jesus' name, amen.